Welcome back to the Gnome Show After Dark, ladies and gentlemen. I am your humble host, Joshua. Um, tonight, we're looking at The Eyes of Everest by Anomaly. Uh, tonight, I am doing a spotlight on uh, this uh, creator. Um, he's got a lot of really good stuff, and I'm checking out some of his uh, short-form content. Um, I'll look at some of his bigger stuff um, at a further, uh, at a, in a further date. For now, um, the eyes of Everest, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> when we were told that Everest was like a sleeping giant, that it had a life of its own, we always associated it with the idea of its majestic expanse, its extreme difficulty in trying to survive the harsh weather, I'd never stopped to consider any different idea, much less to take it literally. I've always thought, it's a mountain, a massive one, sound. It's still just a monumental piece of inert stone victimized by horrendous winds and snowstorms even think that it's not the mountain itself that challenges climbers like me or my friends, but rather our own tested capabilities, which at any moment, in the face of an unexpected event, can become insufficient and deadly. Moore's story began in childhood, with the longing to one day reach the highest point in the world. And yes, literally, we wanted to know how far we could reach into the sky, where it would end, how it would feel to climb above the clouds and observe them from above. 38 years later, we find ourselves here, in a small lost village in Nepal, at the foot of this colossal mass of rock and ice that we have called Everest, in relatively young age. Because yes, there are men and women who double our years and continue to climb mountains. We have ventured for the first time on an expedition that doesn't need an epic ending or a feat that would put us in the record books. It's our first attempt and I know there will be more and it won't be necessary to reach the highest peak because success is being here in the mountains inside this inert natural monster. I am surprised that there are people who can live and survive in places like this. We haven't really started our climb in what we could call the complex expedition and the weather has already treated us very badly in the early morning. However, by noon, the sky has completely cleared and everything Look has remained that. very calm. I can barely hear the breeze and a slight whistle that sneaks between the mountains. The locals have said that this sound is a symbol of the tranquility of nature, announcing good weather for the coming days. We have been lucky. They have also told us about the importance of following the monoliths scattered throughout the mountain range because failing to do so could lead to getting lost and not returning to tell the tale. They were so insistent with that warning that they managed to scare us enough to plan our route based on the position and legends inscribed on the monoliths for the rest of the day. This turned out to be quite helpful because there were really no marked official paths. The ascent was only possible by following the trail that other explorers had kindly left behind, in addition to the monoliths. Equipped with a skilled translator, we were able to make sense of the constant warnings repeated in the stone inscriptions. In some way, the locals wanted to keep outsiders as far away as possible from certain places that, according to maps and testimonies from other explorers, did not pose a real risk of falling or getting lost. Additionally, there was a clear reference to something called the Storm Song, what? which even penetrated the most vicious blizzards and was marked as a clear sign of imminent retreat. Once we decided to start our journey, as seemed to be the tradition of the locals, they bestowed a blessing upon us and made the final suggestion. 
not to carry excessively reflective objects or take photographs with flash cameras. We did the opposite. They didn't mention the consequences, but their warning had to have some logic. The first few hours were breathtaking. It was difficult to describe such majesty. The path was still as comfortable and defined as when we arrived in the village, until, without even realizing it, we almost had the first accident due to the narrowness of the trails that began to require the use of more specialized equipment. Unfortunately, we didn't take long to come across the famous crystallized and intact bodies scattered among the rocks. We didn't expect, to be honest, to find them at such a low altitude. But well, getting here is not for just anyone. Suddenly, and like everything that happens here, unpredictable, we were confronted with a cold gust of wind that, in a matter of seconds, brought such intense fog that we couldn't see more than one or two meters ahead. So it happened for half of the day so it became imperative to take refuge in a small cavernous entrance and make our first base before continuing. Yeah, so you don't get when lost the blizzard the had subsided, the Welcome splendid viewer. views of the mountains returned, but as we climbed higher, any moment of good weather had to be seized to continue our march. This happened constantly during the first half of the journey, until one night things took a very strange turn. Before dawn, two of my companions complained of numbness in one of their legs. Perhaps they hadn't come prepared enough for the expedition. So, we took more than the budgeted time to monitor their health conditions until dawn when we would decide whether to return or continue. Sabat so wasn't what caused the accident that had us on the brink of death at sunrise. It turned out that in the cavern that had naturally formed, Pieces of rocks came loose when one of my companions, in an attempt to stand up upon noticing less numbness in his legs, drove a couple of stakes into a fragile wall of frozen stone. What happened next took us all by surprise, and honestly, I don't remember the situation very well. I only have Vague memories that the cavern cracked in such a way that we fell down one of the mountain slopes, dragged by one half of the rock on which we had been resting at night. Though we didn't suffer injuries that compromised our lives, we were stunned for several minutes until we managed to regain our sense of direction. By then, wow, all of you we had survived. rolled for about 20 meters, Lucky. and we were under a precipice that was our official route and impossible to return to. As an emergency measure, we only relied on compasses and maps that, with pure intuition, seemed to lead us to a trail that we believed was one of those indicated by the official guides. We were so wrong uh. that in the place where we ended up, it was impossible to believe if we hadn't seen it with our own eyes because it was nothing natural, nothing we had seen on any mountain, and honestly, nowhere in the world, something like that couldn't exist. So those who had cameras set out to photograph the impossible surroundings we had. Uh-oh. What the fuck? Are they alive? The warning from the Nepalese locals could not have been truer and literal. The mountains had a life of their own. Hidden in the vastness of the wild nature, they stood among thousands of tons. But they were not just isolated organs. They seemed to be the very life of the mountain. They were the receptors that connected that world with indescribable depths for humans. Those eyes reacted to the wind, to light, and to our own movements, just as those miles-long jaws swallowed impossible gusts of air and frozen droplets. 
the mountain in those areas Whoa. vibrated and swayed as if we were on a beast dozing beneath our feet. You could feel the gentle rocking of the face of a giant that was the very earth on which possibly those Nepalese men and women carried out their daily lives with total normality. The temptation to enter those jaws was enormous, Fuck. but despite being a few feet away at a distance, they were actually enormous holes that would take us days to reach. Perhaps we would encounter something on the way, and most distressing for me, if these mountains knew that we were precisely on them, observing them, yeah, would they, and discovering would they them hidden in the remotest part of the world, even the mere idea of imagining the interior of that immeasurable entrance to it's a like world incomprehensible to anyone who Grayskull. didn't have it before their eyes didn't let me think clearly. I can tell this. I could witness and write mm. about this miraculous experience. There's the thumbnail. Kansen, our most experienced man, with infinite ingenuity, somehow led us to a point we assumed was a guide monolith. By then, we didn't know how we were still standing, or how we were fortunate enough to spot that mound of stones, so tiny compared to what we saw above. After this experience, more than half of my group never engaged in any mountain-related activity or hiking again in their lives. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, I never heard from them directly again. Even in my dreams, I see those enormous eyes those teeth that were mountains themselves. I can't imagine how those images could have intruded into the psyche of the rest of my companions and made them abandon the world. I don't know if I will return, but that place calls me in my moments of greatest weakness. Well, someone will have to take charge of that unknown world. Someone will have to explore those entrances and reveal the secrets that we thought only the depths of the oceans could give us. Currently, uh. there is a world above ours, or it is, in fact, our own that holds within it a universe of which we may not be aware. Believing in the possibility of mastering a giant sleeping beneath our feet, every day and every night, until who knows when. But that moment will come, I know it. That was pretty cool. <laughs> hey man, you never know. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I'll have to come back to it. But I read a book uh, that was uh, kind of like... Well, not kind of. It just reminds me of this. Uh, where like uh, some... Um, like a group of climbers were on Mount Everest and they stopped in a cave and they found a mummified man um, um, in a uh, lotus position in, you know, uh, in the back of the cave. And, um, oh man, what is it? The Descent by Jeff Long. If you can find that book, it's really good. All right. Um, so, uh, that was, uh, the eyes of the forest, like subscribe and share sound off in the comments. Um, if you, um, uh, uh, I don't know, like if you were climbing, um, any mountain and you came across, um, a cave entrance that looked like a, the mouth of a giant beast. Would you, uh, would you, uh, be curious enough to explore it or you would be like, nope, 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 nope. Um, I don't know. I might be dumb enough to go in there and explore. Um, I'll see you guys in the next one. Be safe, happy, and healthy. I love you all.